This recording was produced by Oregon Trail Baptist Church. If you'd like to get more recordings or to leave your feedback, please visit us at www.otbchurch.com or write us at P.O. Box 298, Guernsey, Wyoming, 82214. We look forward to hearing from you, and we hope that today's recording will not just challenge your thinking, but will transform your life. Turn to the book of Acts, chapter 1, this morning in your Bibles, Acts chapter 1. We're going to continue looking at Peter here, and I'm hoping to wrap this up fairly soon with Peter, because he, we've been with him a long time. Uh, made it through the Gospels with Peter, looking at him, and he's very active in Scripture, very active. He's, he's always jumping in there and usually sticking his foot in his mouth, um, and last, where we left him, is where Christ restored him. After he denied Christ three times, Christ three times says, feed my sheep or feed my lambs. Um, and there on the, the seashore of Galilee. Now, we're entering the book of Acts. And so, Peter here is very prominent at the beginning of the book of Acts. But by the end of the book of Acts, he's off the scene. In fact, Paul is prominent. Um, I think by about chapter 10 to 13, Peter is done in the book of Acts and Paul really takes the scene. Um, however, we are going to finish out Peter here, so we'll look a little bit here at Acts t this morning. We will do our, as we're doing for this series, uh, interview. So I will become a schizophrenic for a moment, in which you can smile. Uh, but let's go ahead and read the text for today and then we will conduct an interview with Peter, a man worth imitating because he followed Christ. Chapter 1 of Acts, I'm going to read the first full two chapters um, to give you a little preface. It will be quite a lengthy read, I suppose. Um, the first chapter, Luke is summarizing, Luke who wrote Acts, is summarizing the Gospels in about 14 verses. Um, then in chapter 2, we have a sermon by Peter the first Christian sermon ever preached. So those are what we'll interview Peter about today. Acts chapter 1, verse 1. The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus bo began both to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up. After that, he through the Holy Ghost hath given commandments unto the apostles whom he hath chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, he commanded that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost, not many days hence. When they, were there, when they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, Wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times nor the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. Verse 8, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Then they returned unto Jerusalem, from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey. And when they were come in, they went up into an upper room, where abode both Peter and James and John and, An and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon Zelotes, and Judas, the brother of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women, and Mary the mother of Jesus with his brethren. Verse 15. 
And in those days Peter stood up in the midst of his disciples and said, The number of names together were about a hundred and twenty. Men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost gave by the mouth of David, spake before concerning Judas, which was a guide to them that took Jesus. For he was numbered with us, and hath obtained and had obtained part of this ministry. Now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity, and falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst, and his bowels gushed, gushed out. And it was known unto all the dwellers at Jerusalem, insomuch that the field is called in the proper tongue, Algamea, that is to say, the field of blood. For it is written, verse 20, for it is written in the book of Psalms, Let his habitation be desolate, and let another man dwell therein, and his bishopric let another take. Wherefore of these men which have companied with us, uh, with us all at the time the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism to, of John unto the same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection? And they appointed two, Joseph, called Barsabbas, was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether of these two thou hast chosen, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they gave forth their lots, and a lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. Chapter 2, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there, dwelling, and there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded, because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed, and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue, wherein we are born, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and dwellers of Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia and Philra and Palmyra in Egypt and in the parts of Libya about Cyrene and strangers of Rome and Jews and proselytes. Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. And they were all amazed, and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? Others, mocking, said, These men are full of new wine. Verse 14. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and ye, men, ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words, for these are not drunken, as ye have supposed, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it came to pass in the last days, saith the Lord, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your, old, your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servant and on my handmaids, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy, and I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon into blood, before that great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Verse 22. Ye men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. 
for David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Verse 29. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher with us unto this day is his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This, Jesus, hath God raised up, whereof ye are all witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received, the, uh, received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, hath he shed forth this, which ye now see and hear. For David is not ascended into heaven, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Verse 37. Now when they had heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you, and to your children, and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Verse 41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day they were added unto them about three thousand souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together, and had all things common, and sold their possessions and goods, and parted them to all men, as every man hath need. And they, continuing daily, with one accord in the temple, and breaking of bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and in singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this text of Scripture as you begin to work um, in the book of Acts. And the apostles begin to figure out how to move forward now that you're gone. Lord, today, as we look at this text through the eyes of Peter, I ask for you to encourage us. Don't just give us knowledge about what took place, but Lord, change us, that we may live lives in conformity to your word and your will. We ask this in your son's name. Amen. Well, let's jump into our interview here. Peter, tell us about what happened next. After Christ had died and, and rose from the dead, after he met you and the other disciples on the seashore, by Galilee. What happened next? Well, Luke summarized this well in Acts, as you've read, the beginning of the book of Acts. We were waiting for the promise of the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. We were waiting for that promise. Um, Luke recorded in, in chapter 1, verses 4 to 5, that we were assembled together uh, at Jerusalem waiting for this to happen. Um, and we knew that John was baptized, had baptized with water, but we were about to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And we were, with that baptism, we knew that we were going to receive the power of the Holy Spirit. Acts 1.8 said, But ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me in both Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. We knew that our next step was simply to wait. And much of life, honestly, ends up being a waiting game. But it's much better to wait on the Lord and do what He says than to step out by yourself. We knew we would be witnesses to the end of the earth and all the way. 
Um, but then we, we Acts 1.9, um, And when he had, he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. We, knew, we were there standing. We watched the ascension of Christ. He was with us. He ascended to heaven, and we were kind of dumbfounded and shocked until the two angels said, Hey, okay, you saw him go. Now get back to town. you got, you got stuff to do. And in Acts 1.11, um, they sent us back to town, and, and we waited there in that upper room, having the promise that the Holy Ghost was going to come, having the promise and knowing from Christ that we're going to receive power. We waited and waited. Now, while we were waiting, we, we weren't just twiddling our thumbs. We were earnestly praying. Now, we weren't the only ones in the room. It's the 11. There was Mary, the mother of Jesus, was there, and some other um, women who had followed Jesus in his ministry, and Jesus' half-brothers, some of them were there. And in all, there was about 120 people in this room gathered together, followers of Christ, including us as the apostles. And while we were there waiting, I felt it necessary to fill Judas's place. Let me jump in here a second as pastor. Uh, this is one of these interesting texts of Scripture. Because here the disciples, Peter led in this, they decide we're going to fill in Judas's place. Judas, by transgression, as the text says, fell. He, he was a traitor to the Lord. Well, Peter and the disciples decided to appoint someone else. And you've noticed with the appointing, they picked two guys who they thought were qualified. They set their qualifications, picked these two guys, and then cast lots, a very Old Testament thing, to determine which one of these guys was going to be the fill-in. Uh, if you remember, Christ had promised that the 12 foundations of heaven or the 12 gates would have 12 of the apostles. Well, Judas wasn't going to make it, so they had to fill it in. It's interesting, though, this is where the debate comes in. Was Matthias the right choice? It's hard to say. There's guys who argue, yes, he was, he was, you know, they, they filled him in, they, you know. But there's guys who say, no, the Apostle Paul would have been the right choice. Now, you can read, you can debate. I don't really care. Um, I've read both sides of the argument, and I could go either way. Um, I think very, very legitimately, Paul could have been just called the Apostle to the Gentiles, be kind of the 13th Apostle, because although he had a heart for Jews, he went over and over and over. He was all over the Gentile world. Anyway, I'm going to leave the debate aside. We're just going to let it, let it, let it lie with they chose a new uh, apostle. And, and with that, let's, let's be fair to them. They may have been practicing uh, at this point. They may still have, have some of the, the remnants of their Jewish tradition and practices. And by the end of the book of Acts, you don't see them cast in any lots. You see them depending on the Holy Spirit. So maybe they're, I mean, Christ has just left them. He's just ascended. They're just entering into learning how to walk by faith without a physical Christ there. They're learning to walk by the Spirit. They're learning to listen to Christ. Uh, so I'm not going to bash the guys, all right? So Peter, go ahead, tell us, uh, as you appointed um, this new disciple, what took place? Well, Judas had, you know, he by transgression fell. And he committed suicide, and Luke, Luke was pretty graphic in, in his record of that. Um, and the scriptures actually predicted that this would happen. Back in Psalms, David said, "Let their habitation be desolate, and another dwell in his, and let none dwell in their tents." And later in Psalm 109, he said, "Let his days be few, and let let another take his office." Now, in the Greek, it comes out as bishopric, but it means office. So I, I looked at those and knew those Old Testament passages, and knowing my Old Testament, I thought, well, let's go ahead and fill in the gaps. We are to have 12 apostles, let's fill it in. Well, we decided to pick between men who had been with Jesus from the time of John's baptism, as we, as Luke recorded in, in verses 21 to 22. They were, they're going to have to be someone who had been there at John's baptism, who'd followed Christ a long time, who saw the resurrection, and we chose between this Justice, or, or Joseph, and Matthias. And it's got to be one of these two. And again, as pastor, let me jump in. They, they picked between these two men 
If they didn't give God the third option of, Lord, is it someone else? And don't be stuck in your life and mine of giving God two options and not the third of saying, Lord, is it something else? Lord, should I do this or this today? Or Lord, do you have something else for me to do today? Often we can lock God into our boxes when maybe we should just leave ourselves open to say, Lord, do you have something that I haven't even foreseen today? Uh, anyway, I'll leave that alone and get back to Peter and let him finish out. So Peter, you, you picked between um, this Joseph or Justice and Matthias, and you cast lots, very Old Testament things. Uh, who did it land on? Well, the lot was cast for Matthias, and we all knew him very well, and we decided, hey, he's going to be the 12th apostle to fill in for Judas. So as you waited and you appointed this 12th apostle, what happened next, Peter? What, what took place after that? Well, this is what you now know as Pentecost. We were gathered there in one place in the upper room, and the Holy Spirit descended upon us. As tongues of fire, fire as tongue, split tongues of fire, we heard the sound of a rushing wind. God moved in, and we began to speak languages we didn't know. We, we spoke in other tongues. People heard us in their own language, and we, it was very clear that God was at work. Well, Peter, if you're speaking in foreign languages, didn't you already know the languages of people in Jerusalem anyway? Didn't you already know Greek and Hebrew? Or didn't, didn't you already know those languages? Well, yes, but you have to understand, at, this was on the heels of Passover, and people had come from all over the known world. People had come from Cappadocia, which is up in Turkey. They had come from Mesopotamia. They had come down from Egypt. They'd come from all over the world to celebrate Passover. And because all these different people from different parts of the world were all there at one time, there was a lot of people who didn't speak Hebrew. They didn't speak Greek. They didn't speak the Aramaic, the language of the day. They spoke their own languages. And God enabled us at that time to speak in foreign languages that all of these people could understand and could hear in their native tongue. Peter, as you did this, I bet it got their attention. You bet it got their attention. For them to hear a bunch of Galilean fishermen and men who had, had really very little education to be speaking in languages caught everyone's attention. And in fact, as you go through the book of Acts and as we lived out the book of Acts, there was always two responses to God working. When something like speaking in tongues would happen or something like um, when Stephen was stoned because of his preaching, people respond to a mes the message of God with either repentance and they experience a revival in their life, or they, respond, they reject God's truth and they begin to riot. And that took place right here in our text. There were those who saw the speaking in tongues and said we were drunk. They rejected what God was doing and put up flack. And then there were those who saw what God was doing and believed. Just because God is working at your life, just because amazing things are happening, just because the supernatural may be taking place, doesn't mean people are going to accept it. They'll often criticize it. Our job is not to worry about the, what people do or say. Our job is to worry about walking with the Lord and continue to do what He wants. So as verse, chapter 2, verses 12 and 13 say, They were all amazed and were in doubt, saying, What meaneth this? But others mocked, and these were full of new wine. It is amazing to me as Peter that these men would think that speaking in foreign languages is somehow the fruit of getting drunk. Well, Peter, how did you respond to this? Being accused of being a just drunk, spouting off at the mouth. Well, my response was, I stood up and started preaching. I, I just wanted to clear up the matter. I wanted to be very clear about who Christ was. And I referred to the scriptures back in Joel, where the prophet Joel foretold about all of this. In Joel 2, the prophet said, And it shall come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions, and also the servants upon 
the handmaids, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon to blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Uh, Joel was writing here concerning the last days, the end times, and, and not everything in Joel's passage actually took place right there at Pentecost. Some of it has yet to happen. But he was writing concerning the outpouring of God's Spirit, and the Spirit of God would be poured upon all people, and that's what we were beginning to see happen. Uh, he wrote about signs of God, and we were watching signs of God happen. We were experiencing it. He wrote about God's salvation, saying anyone who will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And we were preaching that. So there, there's thought that, hey, you're just a bunch of drunks preaching. They missed. This is Old Testament prophecy starting to come true. They condemned my actions. And in response, I stressed two points. One, I stressed to these people that Messiah was crucified by his foes, and I was pointing my finger at them because this was the crowd who had crucified him, and that both the Jewish nation and Roman government were guilty of this crime. The Romans had their part and so did the Jews. But secondly, I stressed, look, you may have killed him. You put Messiah, you put Christ to death, but Christ was resurrected by his father. He was the Messiah, he was the chosen one, and they put him to death, but God raised him from the dead. And this was very significant because it was Im impossible to keep, for death to keep a grip on Christ, which gives us as believers hope. It also was from, directly from the scriptures. David predicted that this would happen. Isaiah predicted that this would happen. The resurrected Messiah was predicted, but we missed it. So I stress these points that Christ truly did die, and, and they, you were the ones, as I pointed to the, them, you put him to death, and that, look, this was foretold in Scripture. Don't be surprised that it took place. And as I emphasize those points, I then concluded um, verses 29 to 30 of, of my sermon in Acts 2. I concluded that David must have had Messiah's resurrection in mind, for he himself was dead and buried. And you remember David, he said, look, the one that's going to come after me, he, from my line, from my heritage, from my children, will come one to sit forever on the throne. And although I am his ancestor, he's older than me. David recognized that Messiah was going to come through him and he would be an eternal figure. Also, David recognized, and, and, and very clear here, that this was about Jesus' exaltation. He would be ascended into heaven and sit on the throne. Uh, that could very well be what David was referring to in Psalm 110, verse 1. And the result of my preaching, the result of me emphasizing that Jesus Christ was Messiah, he was crucified, he was risen from the dead, and alive and, and seated at the right hand of the Father and ascended up on high, as I emphasize those, those aspects, conviction came. God's Spirit now stirred in the hearts of the people. And they, their response was, what do we do? Uh, I, verse 37 of Acts 2, Now when they were heard this, they were pricked in their hearts and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? When God through us, and when God through you presents truth to people, it should have the effect of, okay, how do I respond to this? What am I going to do? And clearly, I had got through their heads, clearly, um, those in the crowd, and maybe not all, but they recognized that we had put Messiah to death. Now what do we do? And as a response to that, I, I told them, verse 38, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the Holy Ghost. All of them, myself included, we needed to turn from our sins to our Savior. They were then baptized in the name of Jesus for, their, for forgiveness of sins. Well, 
Peter, you told them what to do here. What did they do? Did they respond to your preaching? Did they respond to your sermon? Many did. Verse 41, a very famous verse of chapter 2. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. My preaching had produced, although they thought I was crazy at first, some did because I'm speaking in foreign languages, my preaching produced the effect, not because I was great, but because Christ was working through me, the Spirit was out, out flowing through me. People turned from being willing to crucify their Savior to repentant and wanting to follow their Savior. And although they didn't maybe fully understand the significance of him, Christ being put to death, they were now willing to follow Christ as their Lord and Savior. And the same day they were added to, to our assembly about 3,000 souls. As we think about this with, with Peter's first sermon, the first Christian sermon preached to probably a very hostile crowd. These Jews were the same Jews who crucified Christ. These Jews were the same Jews who, through Christ's ministry, had been a thorn in his side. Now, again, not all of them, because some of them were simply come in for the Passover and not there the whole time Christ was ministering. But as the crowds gathered, Peter here had preached a very bold sermon. A sermon that very well could have ended up with a riot and putting him to death. Yet he preached very boldly, and Christ came down and met with them. I think the question for us today, is Christ the center of your life and mine? One commentator said, The first Christian sermon was Christ-centered. Peter preached Christ, his incarnation, his, I'm sorry, his incarnate life, death, crucifixion, resurrection, and imminent presence. And the apostles did it, and the apostle did it in a 569 words. He explained God's offer of himself in Christ, what people did to refuse it, what God did in spite of their refusal, and what could now happen to those who would respond. Peter's first sermon here was centered on Christ. Christ died, he rose from the dead, and he is now ascended. You know, God seeks to turn your life and mine upside down. The gospel should transform our lives. It should make a drastic difference. Uh, this instance in Acts 2 is often looked at as the parallel or counter experience of Genesis 11. If you remember back in Genesis 11, that's where the people came together and said, we're going to build this tower, we're going to do this great thing. God had told them to scatter, they didn't. And God there confounds languages. And from Genesis 11 all through the Old Testament, there's now this barrier called language. Today we're in America, we don't experience it as much, although with a lot more immigrants, we, we are experiencing that. You run into people who don't speak English in our country. But you know, there was a day when everybody in the world spoke the same language. God confounded the languages, and here in Acts 2, this barrier to communication is now broken. The Lord enables them through the power of the Holy Spirit to speak languages that until this time they never knew. I don't think they, for instance, if Peter spoke in Cappadocian, whatever language that is, I don't think he for, could forever speak in Cappadocian. But through the book of Acts, there's times when God enables his servants to speak languages they don't know. God can overcome that barrier. The language barrier is conquered through the Holy Spirit. These men were used by God to turn their world upside down. Are things happening in your life and mine that seem absurd? This first sermon preached was centered on Christ the lives of the apostles, Peter, James, and John, and the others, as they lived out through the New Testament, they were centered on Christ and they died for Christ. But how much is your life and mine centered on Christ? Now granted, it, every sermon doesn't always have to be centered on Christ, although I think that's a good thing. 
Christ should be seen through our entire Bible. In fact, as you read the book of Acts and you read Paul's letters, he's constantly pointing to pictures of Christ in the Old Testament. But in our lives, does your life center on Christ or does it center on you? It's very easy to put ourselves at the throne of our life and call the shots instead of Christ. I would encourage today that we center our lives not around our comforts, not around our abilities, not around ourselves, but as Peter centered his sermon on Christ, that we would center our lives on Christ. And then God begins to work in amazing ways. You may not speak in foreign languages. You may not do miracles like Paul ended up doing. You, you may not see those things happen, but you know, when you center your life on Christ, people notice. They notice God's hand in your life. You may not even see it. They notice things in your life that fall into place and work together, and they say, God is with you. Have you ever had that? Have you ever had someone who, who maybe you know or don't know that well that just says, God is with you? I've had that, and it's kind of kind of a sobering thought, like, whoa, you can you can actually tell that God is with me. I see my own failures, I see my own weakness, I see my own blunderings that happen week after week, day after day, and yet through the midst of that, people in whether community or within the church or whatever can say, I can see God working through you. Let's let this week be a week where God is seen through you. I don't know what it means for you to put Christ first. I could give a bunch of platitudes of what that would be. But I think the more important thing would be for you to look in your own life and say, what's seated at the throne of my life? What in my life is more important than Christ? It could be money. It could be sports. It could be family. It could be comfort. It could be fill in the blank. But whatever is in your life and mine that is more important than Christ is hindering from God working and flowing through you. And again, it, you may not start speaking in tongues. In fact, if you did, let's have a talk. Um, <laughs> but I'll tell you what, people will see and notice the difference. And it should be real. The book of Acts is a story of a few men turning the world upside down, starting with Peter right here at the beginning. Let's let this little community of believers be a group that turns our little area upside down. Father, we thank you for this example of Peter and his preaching here in the book of Acts. Lord, would you give us the boldness to say what needs to be said amongst our family and friends and neighbors? Would you give us even the opportunity for that? Lord, we don't always know how you want to work. We don't always know what you want to do with a situation. But Lord, would our lives be absolutely marked by your hand and your presence working in and through us? Lord, we can try to live the Christian life but people are going to see through that. They know a hypocrite from, a, from the real deal. Lord, would you enable us this week to live Christ-centered lives? As Laquita begins to play, just with heads bowed and eyes closed, just spend some time thinking on what What's at the throne of your life? Is Christ at the center or is something else?
the hymn Laquita's playing, Amazing Grace, is very popular, very famous. But it's written by a man who had that life transformation that Peter preached about. John Newton was known for his vulgarity, his wickedness, involved in slave training and in the, the sailor's line of work. A man so hated by the crew that once, instead of throwing him a, a lifeline while he was in the water, they harpooned him in the leg to get him out of the water. He was so hated by his own crew. And yet God got hold of his heart and life. And he turned from a life with self at the center to a life with Christ at the center. And wrote the hymn, probably the most famous hymn ever written, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound. Today he has hymns in our hymnal. Today he's known as a man of faith. But in his day... People saw a transformation. Would they see the same transformation in your life and mine? Let's let the grace of God be the center of our lives. Let this week be marked by God's grace in your life. And would people see it? Father, we thank you for the sermon from Peter, the first Christian sermon ever preached. And Lord, many of us know your word. We know the gospel. We know that Christ is risen from the dead and he's ascended. We know he's interceding for us. We know he's intending to work his life out through ours. And yet, Father, we let so many little things stand in the way. We let, our, we let ourselves sit on the throne of our life. Lord, work in our hearts this week. Lord, we can't crucify self. We can't get ourselves off the throne. But Lord, let us look to Jesus, look to you, the author and finisher of our faith. And would you show us the areas where we're not conform to you? Would you enable us to deal with them and move forward? And would your grace be seen in our lives and be seen by those around us, that people see the transformation, they see the difference in our lives, because we walk with the King of Kings? Would this week be a transforming week in our lives? May I ask this in your son's name. Amen.